How many of you love the Thanksgiving season? It's actually one of my more, how shall we say it? I prefer this over many of the other holidays that we do have because it's actually God-based. And for some, some reason, uh, as things would have it, you notice how this God-given holiday is actually stuck between two pagan ones. That kind of overshadows it, right? But uh, praise God, give thanks. What wonderful music. Have you been blessed so far? Was that testimony inspiring? My, oh my, God is good. It's so amazing to see how things work together because um, this morning we had a Sabbath school and we talked about a Samaritan, right? Well, we're going to be talking about another one today. And it's just interesting how things coalesce together. In fact, this song, uh, when Janine contacted me and said, which closing song do you want? And I gave her a couple, and actually one of them was Give Thanks. And we just heard that. So praise God and how he works things out. Well, we're going to get into the prop message proper. And before we do, what do you suppose we're going to do? That's right. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we just want to praise you and thank you because you are awesome. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And we just heard testimony of how all things work together for good to those that love you and are called according to your purpose. And Father, we have been called by the Holy Spirit to be here, to worship your Son, Jesus Christ. And we dare not do so by our own strength and our own merits. So we just ask that you forgive us Forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and renew a right spirit within us, and give us the mind of Christ, so that the Holy Spirit can take this message and transform us as we eat this spiritual food this morning. We pray your blessings upon us so that we may be a blessing to others, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Depending on how you count, the gospel records that Jesus performed around 40 miracles. Some say 37, some say 42, but again, it just depends on how you count. But of those 40 or so miracles, scripture records only two detailed stories of Jesus healing leprosy. Leprosy. According to Mark, the first healing of leprosy happened early on in Jesus' Galilean ministry. And you can find that in the Synoptic Gospels. And I recognize sometimes I use words that some of us don't know. How many of you ever heard of the term Synoptic Gospels before? Okay, about half of you. How many of you know what that means? Less than half of you. All right, so Synoptic Gospels refers to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason this is, they're referred to as the synoptic gospel is, what does synoptic sound like? Huh? It sounds like synopsis, right? You heard the synopsis. You're getting an overall picture, and it's a chronological storytelling. Well, in the synoptic gospels, you have over 75% of Mark's content that is found in both Matthew and Luke, and 97% of Mark's gospel is found in at least one of the other two synoptic gospels. So Matthew, 24%, Luke, 23%, they also have material that's in common that's not in Mark's, and only exclusive to Mark is only 3%, which leads people to believe that's why Mark, the gospel of Mark, was one of the very first Gospels written about Jesus Christ. And here's something that's important for you, which is when you talk about source, 
The closer you are to the original event, historically, the more accurate your recollection is. Isn't that true in our lives? And you've all played that little telephone game where you have one person tell the neighbor next to them something and the message gets down on the line and the last person has to repeat it. Is it usually the same? No, it's not. And so the closer you are to the original source, and people estimate that Mark was written sometime around 50 to 100 AD. So that's relatively recent in terms of what took place in uh, Bible times. And he actually wrote a lot of it, and Matthew and Luke derived a lot of their work for it. And that's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke are referred to as the Synoptic Gospels. John isn't, because he doesn't follow their same kind of format. Anyway, according to Mark, the first healing of leprosy happened early on in Jesus' Galilean ministry, and you find this story of Jesus healing the leper in the Synoptic Gospels, and you have the most detail in Mark's account in Mark chapter 1, You'll also find it in Matthew 8 and Luke 5. But he has the most details of Jesus healing a leper. And you can, start, you can see that starting in verse 40. Well, what is leprosy? Well, leprosy is a chronic infection usually caused by a bacterium. And that's a single bacteria uh, called Mycobacterium leprae. And this was the only known cause of leprosy, and it was discovered in 1873 by a Norwegian physician, Gerard Hansen, which is why the medical term for leprosy is called Hansen's disease. That's something that uh, medical science does, is they name diseases after the person who discovers them. Uh, and then in 2008, there was a second species they found, Mycobacterium lepromatosis, and this was discovered in Mexico. There's something that you need to know about leprosy today. Contrary to popular belief, today, leprosy is not highly contagious. It rarely causes death, and you can stop its progression by using antibiotics. But the best prevention for you is to avoid contact with the rashes and the bodily fluids of anyone who might have leprosy. But you have to recognize during Jesus' day, the reaction to leprosy was quite severe. People, when they knew that other people were leprous, oh boy. And this reaction to leprosy was based on Old Testament ideas. And particularly, you'll find in Leviticus chapters 13 and 14, how to diagnose leprosy, how to uh, segregate, and how to do ritualistic um, purification. But many scholars, based on Le uh, Leviticus chapters 13 and 14, reading through the symptom pictures, they all agree, well, not all of them, but most of them agree that the word leprosy actually refers to more than just what we think of Hansen's disease or leprosy, and that it actually encompasses much more uh, ailments that affect the skin. So there are many scholars that believe the Hebrew and Greek words should actually be translated generally as skin disease, skin disease. Well. Those Levitical laws that were given to the children of Israel, were, they were given for public health reasons, they were given for spiritual reasons, but ultimately for personal physical health reasons. For instance, if you look in Leviticus chapter 13, 45, and 46, it says, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his ha head hang loose, and he shall cover up his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. And he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. Too bad they were born in a day when they didn't have antibiotics, right? Yeah. He is unclean. He shall live alone, and his dwelling shall be outside the camp. Another commentator, of all the diseases known in the East, the leprosy was most dreaded. Most dreaded. 
its incurable and contagious character and its horrible effect upon its victims filled the bravest with fear. Among the Jews, it was regarded as a judgment on account of sin and hence was called the stroke or the finger of God. Deep-rooted, ineradicable, deadly, it was looked upon as a symbol of sin. So if a person had leprosy, the, the socioeconomic culture of that day looked at you and said that you were someone that was cursed by God. That you got this disease because you were sinning. And so they automatically wrote you off and said that you were irredeemable. And this mentality that was fostered for hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ came was the reason why you had this strong negativity towards lepers. In fact, to the Jew, curing leprosy was just as difficult as resurrecting someone from the dead. Let me say that again. Curing leprosy was just as difficult as raising someone from the dead. In all of biblical history, only two people have been cured of leprosy. Do you know who they are? Miriam, that's right. She rebelled against uh, her younger brother, Moses, and had leprosy for seven days. And I heard the other name. Who was the other one? Naaman, who had to dip himself in the dirty Jordan River seven times before his leprosy disappeared. Now, you can find those stories respectively in Numbers 12 and 2 Kings 5. But for 700 years, nobody had healed a leper. So this is why when Jesus was speaking to the disciples of John the Baptist, he actually uses this as a proof of his messiahship. In Luke 27, 22, curing leprosy was considered an unmistakable sign of the Messiah. So, the Jews popularly regarded leprosy as a divine judgment on sin, and thus lepers were stigmatized. They were shunned. Not merely because people were afraid of catching the disease, but because leprosy would make a person ritually unclean. And to touch a leper defiled a Jew almost as much as touching a dead corpse. So imagine the minds blown when they saw Jesus reach out and touch the leper. How did Jesus heal this leper? By touching him. By touching him. The work of Christ in cleansing the leper from his terrible disease is an illustration of his work in cleansing the soul from sin. The man who comes to Jesus was full of leprosy. Its deadly poison permeated his whole body. The disciples sought to prevent their master from touching him. Why? For he who touched a leper became himself unclean. But in laying his hand upon the leper, what happened? Jesus received no defilement. His touch imparted life-giving power. The leprosy was cleansed, and thus it is with the leprosy of sin. You and I might not have that skin disease, but you and I are infected with sin. We need the life-giving power of Jesus' touch in our hearts and minds today. Thus it, is, it, it is, thus it is with the leprosy of sin, deep-rooted, deadly, impossible to be cleansed by human power. But Jesus, coming to dwell in humanity, received no pollution. His presence had healing virtue for the sinner. Whoever will fall at his feet, saying in faith, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Do you believe that, my brothers and sisters? You will then hear the answer 
from Jesus, I will be thou made clean. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So that was the first story. The second story is about ten lepers, and the only person who records this story is the physician Luke. Turn with me to Luke 17. We're going to read the whole passage. I almost made Warren read everything, but we'll read it together. I'm not going to put it on the screen, so bring out your devices or you might have a Bible in front of you. Let's look at Luke 17, chapter 11 through 19. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourself to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were, not, were, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give to glory except this stranger? And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. So as the text tells us, Jesus was entering a village, and there were ten lepers outside this village in accordance with Leviticus 13.46. And they stood afar off, as they were supposed to do, and as the Mosaic law required, they started to chant a chorus. Now initially they were saying, Unclean, unclean. How many of you would love to go around saying that to other people? I'm unclean, I'm unclean. You know? That's really horrible, huh? But this is what they did, and they decided to say together, Jesus, Master, have mercy, mercy on us. Whenever you've come across a situation that you don't know what to do, what is your natural instinct? Is this your natural instinct? It should be. It should be. Hosanna, Father, God, Jesus, save us. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. This should be the cry of each one of us here. And so when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. What was Jesus telling them to do? Was he telling them to do, obey the, uh, the Levitical laws? Yes. He told them that according to, he told them to go show themselves to the priests because according to Mosaic law, the priests served as the public health officers. They would be the ones to diagnose the leprosy and they were the ones that ordered the segregation. You, you see this in Leviticus 14. And remember, other skin diseases were described by the term leprosy. So this suggests that the priests were not always able to screen out the curable skin diseases at the time. Because if you lived during those times, you didn't have antibiotics, so if you got the bacteria, you're going to have leprosy, and you're going to get the effects of it. Unless you have a very, very strong immune system, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. But... They would go to the priest, and they would get examined, and they would show uh, that, hey, maybe that thing you said was leprosy isn't really leprosy, and please re-examine me, tell me what kind of purification rites I need to perform, and presumably there would be some sort of a certification, because after you got this, guess what? You got to go home. How many of you love being separated from your loved ones? No. Imagine being outside the village and you can see your family inside the village. They're doing their daily routines, but you can't even go touch them. You can't even talk to them. What a horrible existence. I can kind of relate because right now my family is in Tennessee and I'm here. And I know they're watching, so hello. I miss you guys terribly. But thank God we don't have 
real life leprosy, right? So they could go home after they got re-examined, do the purification rites, and get their little certification. Now, with these 10 lepers, like the first leper that Jesus encountered, did Jesus touch these 10 lepers? No, he stood off, they stood afar off and he was, yeah, it was kind of like long distance healing, right? He didn't touch them. How many of them started going to the priests? All of them, all of them. How many of them were healed? All of them. How many of them noticed that they were healed? All of them. How many of them returned? Just one. Just one. One thing here you need to notice is they were being healed as they were going. As they were going. So when did the lepers get healed of their leprosy? As they went. Notice there's an action that's required. Healing was condition, conditional upon an act of faith. They were not healed so long as they lingered in Jesus' presence, but only as they proceeded to carry out his instructions. What does it mean to carry out Jesus' instructions? To obey. To obey. To obey. They had to obey because if they stayed with Jesus, they would still be leprous. But Jesus said, go to the priests, and on the way, their bodies started to rejuvenate. Think about it. When they left Jesus, they were still leprous. Imagine if they had waited for some visible evidence of healing before going to the priests. Healing would have not ever taken place. It was necessary for them to act in faith as if they were already healed before the healing actually came. He who does not come to the Lord in faith need not expect to receive anything of the Lord, James 1.7. Because without obedience there is no faith, for faith without works is dead, James 2.17. He who has genuine faith will act in accordance with every requirement of God. Not because obeying God merits you anything. It's that because you have a love relationship with God that you're willing to do what he wants you to do. And invariably, what God wants you to do is good for you. Folks, without faith, obedience is impossible and unavailing. In fact, I would maintain that faith and obedience cannot exist without the other. So as they went, they were noticing that they got cleansed. But only one came back. He came back with gratitude. He recognized that the divine power had released him from the bonds of his loathsome disease. One of them, it says. The Samaritan, he made first things first. He praised God. What a prime example of gratitude. The, the Bible text tells us that the Samaritan went so far as to prostrate himself onto the ground in front of Jesus' feet. That's true humility, isn't it? You know, the word humble means close to the ground. Did you know that? Yeah, Charlotte's Web told me that. Close to the ground. And the word humble, the actual origin of that word is hummus. Not the stuff you eat, but the dark, rich soil. So true biblical humility is recognizing that's where I came from, the dirt. That God is the creator God. 
And that was what he did. He prostrated himself, saying, you are God. Now imagine, one of the things, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail, that happens with a lot of lepers is they, they start losing fingers and toes and things like that. Okay? So, can you imagine some of these guys, as they're going, their finger starts to rejuvenate? Or their toe starts coming back? I mean, this is a miracle of all kinds of miracle, right? There are documented cases of little children who get their fingers cut off, they regrow a finger. Did you know that? It's in medical science. You can go find it. But these were grown, grown men who they were being rejuvenated on their way to the priest. Why? Because they obeyed. They obeyed. Interestingly enough, Jesus asks, we're not ten cleansed? It's almost like he has a sense of humor, right? Well, obviously, duh, Jesus. Yeah, ten were cleansed. And he's like, where are the nine? Where are the nine? Here is evidence from Jesus that shows that it matters to God whether we appreciate the good things we receive from his hand. The nine should have been profoundly grateful, but Seemingly, they weren't, according to the text. At least, they didn't express any appreciation. And I'm quoting here. The others went their way, forgetting him who had made them whole. How many are still doing the same thing? The Lord works continually to benefit mankind. He is ever imparting his bounties. He raised, raises up the sick from beds of languishing. He delivers men from peril which they do not see. You know how many times you get angry when you're driving in traffic and you're going, why did I get stuck behind this truck or whatever, right? Well, maybe God is trying to slow you down because he doesn't want to get you into an accident further down the road, you know? So maybe instead of cursing that guy out in front of you, praise, praise God, yeah? It's a different mindset, isn't it? Yeah. He delivers men from peril which they do not see. He commissions heavenly angels to save them from calamity, to guard them from the pestilences that walketh in darkness and the destruction that wasteth at noonday, Psalms 91.6. But their hearts are unimpressed. He has given all the riches of heaven to redeem them, and yet they are unmindful of his great love. By their ingratitude, they close their hearts against the grace of God. Like the heat in the desert, they they know not where good comes from, and their soul inhabits the parched places of the wilderness. But here, this stranger, this foreigner, returned, gave glory to God. You know, it's interesting to me how God works things out. I said that earlier, but here in Scripture, who was the first person that God or Jesus revealed his divinity to? Does anyone know? No? Samaritan woman. That was the first time he revealed to anyone that, yes, I am the Christ. Right? Who was the parable that we heard about this morning? Huh? It was about the good Samaritan. Right? If you look through, and here is now the grateful stranger. He's also a... Samaritan. What was the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews at the time? Not good. That's putting it mildly. Yeah. If they had a choice between saving a dog and saving a Samaritan, what would a Jew do? Save the dog. And you know what? We're living in a culture like that today. Did you recognize that? We are living in a culture where people put more emphasis on animals than they do their fellow man. Now, I'm not trying to knock any of us pet owners out here, okay? But we need to remember that humanity is what God created in his image, okay? But the Jews had this animosity, this vitriol, this hatred against the Samaritans. In fact, two of Jesus' disciples were known as the sons of Thunder, and they said, oh, that Samaritan town, hey, Jesus, you want us to pray and call fire down and destroy them all? Remember that? Yeah. 
And yet, this Good Samaritan parable that we heard about this morning, Jesus asked, who is the neighbor? Who is the neighbor? So think about it. That one Samaritan who came back, for the sake of that one Samaritan, Jesus Christ healed ten of them. And to that grateful stranger, Jesus proclaims, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. How many of you read, Where is God when it hurts? I see only one hand, two, three. Oh, wow. This book came out in the 70s, so there's no excuse for some of you older folks here. And you young folks, read it, because I read this when I was in high school, and I read it multiple times. It is fascinating. It is life-changing. Now, granted, am I espousing everything that Philip Yancey promotes and believes? Of course not. But you can get deep lessons from this book. Where is God when it hurts? I read this again, like I said, back in high school. And one of the stories this book contains is about Dr. Paul Wilson Brand. Dr. Paul Brand. He is a, was a world-renowned orthopedic specialist and a leprosy surgeon. He was the son of missionary parents. And he spent time in his early years, I think up to the age of nine, in the mountains of southwest India with his missionary parents. And then he went back to London at nine, and he was educated there, completed his medical school training at London University, became a fellow at the Royal College of Surgeons, and then together with his wife, Margaret, who he met in medical school, he returned to India in 1946. Some of you were born then to teach surgery in the Christian Medical College and Hospital in Valor. And I'm quoting now a passage from this book. One day, in the, midst of this, in the midst of this time of field research, Dr. Brand went to fetch some supplies from a little storeroom behind the hospital. And the reason I'm sharing this story from this book is because when I read it back then, it made an indelible impression on me. Now, this is only one of the stories, but my goodness, you know how things just stick with you? Well, this story stuck with me all these years. So, he went to fetch some supplies from a little storeroom behind the hospital, and he tried to open the door, but a rusty padlock would not yield. Just at that moment, one of his youngest patients strolled by, an undersized, malnourished 10-year-old. Brand liked the boy for his pleasant cooperative spirit. Oh, Sahib doctor, let me try, the boy said, and reached for the key. And with a quick jerk of his hand, he turned the key in the lock. Brand was dumbfounded. How could this weak youngster, half his size, exert such force? His eyes caught a telltale clue. Was that a drop of blood on the floor? Upon examining the boy's index finger, Bran discovered the act of turning the key had gashed it open to the bone. Skin, fat, and joint were all exposed, and yet the boy was completely unaware of it. To him, the sensation of cutting his finger to the bone was no different from that of picking up a stone or turning a coin in his pocket. After that incident, Brand redoubled his efforts to test his theory about leprosy being a secondary, not primary, cause of injury. He began measuring the fingers of his patients every, each day and tried to account for every blister, every ulcer, every cut. He learned that his patients were living in great danger because of their painlessness. Painlessness. Now you'll see here an example of a little girl with leprosy on her, on her cheek. And Leopold in the middle there, you'll see that all of his fingers have been eroded away. And then you have a young boy there who is missing some fingers and toes and even part of his leg. Leprosy affects you to the point where you cannot feel things 
like you and I do. So you have your hand on the stove, and, and it's on. Is your hand going to stay on the stove for a while? Yes. No, I'm talking about you. Yeah, you're going to move your hand. You're going to be like, whoa, that's hot. They don't do that. Neurologically, they don't feel that. This is why they have damage to them, and this is why they lose appendages and, and things like that. So, when you read this book, you will recognize that pain is God's love to you. Pain is God's love to you. In fact, Dr. Brand discovered that leprosy patients suffer from the simple reason that they have a defective pain system. And he came up with a tendon transplant thing that's still being used today. He pioneered the area of treating leprosy. Fascinating man, fascinating book. And he said, Dr. Brand said, thank God for inventing pain. I don't think he could have done a better job. It's beautiful. Question, have you thanked God when you stubbed your toe? Never? Next time you stub your toe, praise God, you can still feel it. Now you're laughing. I'm being serious. How often are we supposed to rejoice? All the time. Even when you stub your toe. Imagine if you had leprosy and you couldn't feel that pain. You'd end up losing your toe. In fact, research has shown that gratitude, you're going you're gonna to be blown away by some of these things here. Gratitude improves pain tolerance. Study shows that the daily practice of gratitude Gratitude helps lessen an individual's sensitivity to pain. How many of us have chronic pain? Well, maybe instead of complaining about it, we should start praising God about it. Hmm. According to Bruce Singer, a psychologist and founding director of the Chronic Pain and Recovery Center, the practice of gratitude may not completely eliminate chronic pain, but it can be an effective pain management tool as it helps shift the focus away from the physical pain and to more positive things instead. I have a whole list of research I could share with you, but because of time, I'm not going to. But basically, every single time you praise God, every single time you say thank you to someone, that act of gratitude rewires your neural pathways. The, counter, the countervailing point is true, too. Every single time you complain, every single time you moan, that also rewires your brain neural pathways. And just like your muscles, the more you exercise those neural pathways, the thicker they become. And they've seen this in, in uh, scans. So what do you think God wants us to do? Does he want us to complain all the time? Or does he want us to rejoice all the time? Because he knows that's going to develop good neural pathways. Yes, neural plasticity. Yes. Practicing gratitude also leads to lower levels of hemoglobin A1C. This is the glucose indicator for uh, diagnosing diabetes. The researchers have found that grateful individuals were able to lower, decrease their A1C count by 9 to 13 percent. That's almost medication level. Another study shows that the practice of gratitude reduces the biomarkers of inflammation by 7 percent with people who have congestive heart failure. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Multiple studies have shown gratitude helps strengthen the immune system to the point where if you had a strong immune system, that leprosy vi uh, bacteria, you wouldn't get it. Yeah. 
Chemical activities in various regions of the brain also indicate that gratitude correlates to moral judgment. That's no accident, is it? Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Have any of us duly considered how much we have to be thankful for? Do we remember that the mercies of the Lord are new every morning and that his faithfulness faileth not? Do we acknowledge our dependence upon him and express gratitude for all his favors? <laughs> On the contrary, we too often forget that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. When the ten lepers were healed, only one return to find Jesus and give him glory. Church family, let us not be like the unthinking nine whose hearts were untouched by the mercy of God. As the Bible says, in how many things? In everything. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Folks, this is God's will. And if it's God's will, what ought we to do? Obey and be grateful. How many of you have been touched by the mercy of God today? How many of you would like the would be like the grateful stranger, the Samaritan? How many of you want to glorify God? How many of you want to fall down in your face at Jesus' feet and give him thanks? If that's your desire, I tell you that Jesus is proclaiming to you too, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Father, help us to be like the Samaritan, the grateful stranger, the one who has been touched by the mercy of God, the one that came back and offered you thanksgiving. Father, we look at our lives, and there are so many things in our lives that we just take for granted. The fact that we're even here right now, breathing and, and moving and living, and that our heart keeps beating, and that we just breathe on our own without thinking about it. All of this is just a miracle. And too often we just live lives for our own selves. Father, help us to change our neural pathways. Give us the mind of Christ. Give us the spirit of gratitude. Help us to practice this gratitude on a daily basis, even if we stub our toes. Change us because we need changing, Father. We want to glorify you, fall down our face at Jesus' feet and give you thanks. And we want to hear, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Thank you for this message. Thank you for blessing us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.